about finite element analysis. Okay? And just to illustrate to you what it means, supposing we have a circle, then that's a, a, a continuous function. Okay? And we can discretize it by splitting it up into elements like this to represent it on your computer and to simplify the problem. And you can see that it's an approximation of the real function. Okay? But I can make it as accurate as I want by making the element smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay? So in finite element analysis, first of all, we divide our body into a whole set of elements, where the elements are connected together at nodes, put all these together, and that's called a finite element mesh. And this process of dividing up your complicated object into uh, small elements is called discretization. And if you are dealing with uh, a problem of forces and displacements, which is very often what you do in finite element analysis, then we would generate for each one of these elements uh, what we call a stiffness matrix. And that might be very simple because we are dealing with linear elements, say. And then we combine the effects of all of the individual stiffness matrices into a global stiffness matrix. So I'm going to go through this whole procedure today uh, in the context of forces and displacements. So this is the entire procedure for creating a finite element model for an object. So let's imagine that we have a single spring and it's connected rigidly here, so this point doesn't move at all. And we've applied a force F at this point and caused a displacement delta. And assuming that we've chosen a small enough unit, we can say that force will be proportional to displacement, and K is the stiffness of that spring. It's a straightforward Hooke's law type of uh, spring. There's no reason why you know, your object should obey this force versus displacement uh, law, but if you make your element small enough, then it can be approximately linear dependence of force and displacement. Now let's consider this spring, which is in a system of springs, and uh, I want to develop uh, an equation to relate all the displacement and forces for this particular element, which is between nodes one and two. The nodes are simply the connections between the springs. And once the force has been applied, the system is not moving, so it's at equilibrium. Okay. So the sum of forces on that element will be zero. That's straightforward, isn't it? Okay. So when this spring is at equilibrium, the sum of forces equals zero, and it follows that F2 will be equal to minus F1. Now, when I have this force F2 acting on this, it causes a displacement delta 2. But notice that this force F1 is also causing a displacement delta 1. So the net displacement will be delta 2 minus delta 1. Yeah. So the relationship between F2 and the displacement, delta 2, F2 causes delta 2, but we've also got this displacement here, which effectively reduces the total. So we have delta 2 minus delta 1, and the stiffness constant k. Everybody happy with that? Yeah. Although I'm pulling the spring this way, I'm also doing that. And therefore, the net displacement is smaller than delta 2. Right? So we have the force at node 2 equals k times delta 2 minus delta 1. So what's the corresponding equation for F1? Minus of this? Yeah, because we decided in the previous slide that F2 is minus F1. And therefore we get F1 is K delta 1 minus delta 2. I mean, you can see that logically just by looking at the diagram. You don't need that equilibrium equation to decide that. So we worked out the relationship between the forces and displacement for that element. And there is, there is quite a nice elegant way of uh, representing this equation. So again, I've repeated these two equations here. And instead of writing them out as separate equations, I could simply write a matrix here of F1 and F2, and delta 1 and delta 2. If I multiply F1, uh, so row by column, 
then I will end up with this equation. And similarly, F2, I'll end up with this equation. Is everybody happy with matrices? We are not going to do anything complicated. It's just a matrix representation of two equations. Yeah. Are you happy with matrix notation? And you understand how I go from there to there? So F1 is given by K into delta 1 minus K into delta 2. And similarly, F2 is given by minus K into delta 1 plus K into delta 2. Okay, so it's rho by column. This is called the stiffness matrix for that element. Okay, so that's the stiffness matrix for an individual element. Okay, let's consider a more complicated situation where we're looking at two of these elements, and that's node 1, node 2, and node 3 and the corresponding displacements. Again, at equilibrium, the sum of all the forces will be zero. Yeah? F1, F2, F3 will be zero. So, if I just look at this diagram, F1 will be the displacement caused by F1 less the displacement there, delta 2. Uh, the corresponding equation for F3 is the this time we are not assuming that the stiffness is the same for all the springs. So we've got different values of stiffness for spring 1 and another stiffness for spring 2. So F3, we've got the displacement due to F3 which is delta 3 less this movement here, delta 2. Okay. And from our equation for equilibrium, F2 will be equal to uh, minus F1 plus F3. So we get this relationship here for for this force. Happy with that? Now again, I can represent this uh, set of three equations using a 3 by 3 matrix. So I've got the three equations here, F1, F3, and F2. And I've got the forces as a single column matrix and the displacements as a single column matrix and if I multiply this by this then I get this equation here if I multiply this row by this column I get this equation and similarly this row by this column I get this equation so that's now the stiffness matrix for the two elements together what I want to show you is that we could have generated this by deriving two stiffness matrices for the individual elements and combining them to form a global stiffness matrix. So this is for the set of two elements. But for each individual element, if I just looked at F1 and F2, then I have a stiffness matrix there. And I could have a similar stiffness matrix for F2 and F3. Now, in order to combine them, the dimensions of the matrices must be identical, right? So I want to represent you know, F1, F2, and F3. So all I do is I add these <coughs> zeros here to make this into a 3 by 3 matrix. Okay? Are you happy with that? There's, there's no real difference between this and this, except that I've changed the dimensions of the matrix because I want to end up with a 3 by 3 matrix. Okay. Similarly, I have a, a matrix for the F2 and F3 where I've simply added these zeros here to convert the stiffness matrix for the two-dimensional one into a three-dimensional one. Okay. Now you can see that if I add these two up, then I'll end up with the matrix that we derived here. Okay. If I add those two up, just linearly add them up, and I get my global stiffness matrix. Now you can see that if I have a million elements, I could do this and get a global stiffness matrix by considering the individual elements and combining their effects. That's the meaning of a global stiffness matrix. Now, of course, your matrix will become very large, and a lot of the uh, sort of cleverness that goes into finite element analysis is how to handle large matrices and how to invert them and so forth and so on. 
but the principles of finite element analysis are very, very easy, as you can see. We had two separate stiffness matrices, we combined them into a single global stiffness matrix, and now I can calculate the displacement as a function of the forces uh, at any location in my mesh. I mean, in this case, I only have three nodes, but if I had a much larger matrix, I could calculate the displacements as a function of any of the forces at any node. So does it seem too simple? It, it, it really is that simple. The essence of finite element analysis is that simple. You then get into all kinds of complications because you have to handle very large matrices. But that's another story. Now, this is one way of deriving the global stiffness matrix. Uh, I'll illustrate to you now another way of doing it, which, <coughs> which simplifies the mathematical operations associated with large matrices. So we could start by considering, instead of forces and displacement, we could start by considering the potential energy of the system. Because when I stretch the system, uh, there will be strain energy stored. Yeah. Plus, when I stretch it, the forces are actually moving through a distance, and therefore they do work force times distance is work, isn't it? So, uh, looking at this system here, uh, this is rigidly fixed over here. This is spring 2, spring 1 and spring 3. This is rigidly fixed and we are applying forces F1 and F3 here. What do you think will be the force at node 2? Yeah, yeah, because you're doing that, there'll be no net force at node 2. we are rigidly fixed here, so there'll be a reaction force which opposes F1 and F3. And it'll be exactly equal to F1 plus F3. And that's the reason why we've got a zero over here. And these are, as we did before, that F1 causes a displacement delta 1, but you've also got this displacement delta 2, so the net is delta 1 minus delta 2. And similarly, here we have delta 3 minus delta 2. So first I'm going to derive the stiffness matrix as we did before, and then use a potential energy approach to derive the stiffness matrix. Now, for each of those cases, I can work out a strain energy. And you remember, when we have stress being plotted versus strain, and we're looking at uh, linear elasticity, what is the stored energy? <laughs> it's the area under the curve, which will be half sigma epsilon, which is uh, equivalent to half times the modulus into epsilon squared. Okay. Now here we are not doing stress and strain, but force and displacement. But if I wanted to work out the stored energy here, it would be half K1 into delta 1 minus delta 2 squared. And that's where the term comes from. Okay. So when I apply that force to that spring, that's the amount of stored energy in that spring. Now obviously I can do the same thing for the other springs. So this is for uh, F3 for this spring I have half K3 into delta 3 minus delta 2 squared now this node here is being displaced delta 2 so there will be energy stored inside spring 2 and that is the stiffness of spring 2 times delta 2 squared yeah it's rigidly fixed at the other end, so that delta 2 is the actual displacement here. There's no displacement at this point. Okay. So that is the strain energy that's stored inside the springs. Yeah, everybody happy with that? In addition, we have the forces being displaced to distances. So if I go back, you know, F1 here moves through a distance delta 1 and F3 moves through a distance delta 3. We don't have a net force here. 
So this is the stored energy and this is the work done. So that's the net amount of potential energy in our system. Make sense? Now, if I differentiate that potential energy with respect to displacement, then I get force. So if I now take that potential energy here and displace it with respect to delta 1, I get this equation here. And from that equation, uh, in order to find equilibrium, we set that to 0. From that, I can get F1 equals K1 into delta 1 minus delta 2. And similarly, uh, 0 equals that and F3. So by working out the potential energy of the system, I could actually have obtained those equations that we had earlier by considering displacements uh, in exactly the same form. So we end up with the matrix F1, 0, F3 gives us uh, K1 times delta 1 minus K1 times delta 2. K1 times delta 1 minus K1 times delta 2. And this complicated term here, representing this. And minus K3 times delta 2, minus K3 times delta 2, and K3 times delta 3. And this is our global stiffness matrix. So you can start with potential energy, differentiate it with respect to particular displacements, set that to zero to find the equilibrium condition, and derive your global stiffness that way as well. So two different approaches. In this case, again we are rigidly fixed over there. We have a spring 2, 1, 3 and I've added another one here which is rigidly fixed at that end. So everything is the same except that we have this additional element here. Now, all I have to do is I take the original three terms that we had. Yeah. Remember, this is the potential energy inside spring 1, spring 2, spring 3. I now add to that the potential energy inside this spring. Straightforward. Stiffness of spring 4 times the displacement squared. And these terms are the same. And I can get my global stiffness matrix by differentiating this equation with respect to the displacements. So I don't have to think in detail. You know, I can just write this equation down, do the differentiation, uh, and obtain these equations, and therefore the global stiffness matrix. So that's that's quite a, a complicated system we had. Of course, it's it's only got four elements, but nevertheless. You know, if you started to think about it, uh, you might be worried if you didn't follow this approach. From this, we could derive the relationship between the displacement at any of these nodes as a function of any of the forces. So, everybody happy? You know, that really is the essence of finite element. Now, I said to you when I had the first slide that of course this is not a perfect representation of a circle. And I can make it more and more perfect by making these elements smaller and smaller. Right? What is the problem with that? Sir? You both said it at the same time, sir? You obviously increase the computation time, but there's a, another problem as well, isn't there? It can be very perfect. Sorry? I mean, um, whatever small the element is, you can only reach the, the final effect. Yeah. I mean, you've always got to decide what is the accuracy with which I want to do the problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the other problem I'm thinking about is that every time you do a, a numerical calculation in a, in a computer, there will be some sort of an error because of the precision 
because you do the calculation. Your computers don't do calculations perfectly. They might do it to eight decimal places or to 16 decimal places or to 32 decimal places. You have to, dis uh, you know, depending on what kind of computer you buy or software you use. So you, are, you might be accumulating errors which, which may not be very large because of the numerical accuracy of your computer if the number of elements you're using is small. But if it's very, very large, then maybe the precision of your computer is not sufficient to cope with the huge number of calculations. So in any finite element problem, you, you cannot just do one calculation. You have to do a series of calculations with different numbers of uh, elements and decide the point where you have reached you know, uh, sufficient accuracy to solve your particular problem. I can't have an infinite number of elements. But this applies to any numerical technique, even if you are solving equations iteratively. If, if that solution requires billions and billions of calculations, then your numerical accuracy will depend on the precision of your software and your computer. Any other questions? Okay, in the next lecture we'll do the same sort of thing but for thermal uh, diffusion, heat diffusion. There are no bonds with the atoms. It's only those atoms at the interface which see the presence of the B atom. Yeah, is, are you happy with that? Okay, so what, what, what can we do? Well, we've got to scale this by the amount of surface we have in a volume of material. It's only a thin layer here, an atomic layer here, which feels the presence of other species of atoms. Yes? Now, what do you think? Does the amount of surface per unit volume increase when my particle size decreases? Or does the amount of surface per unit volume? And the convention is surface per unit volume is written like this. Does that increase or decrease as particle size is reduced? I mean, I can go back to this diagram. What do you think? The amount of surface, is it increased relative to this? Yeah. So as you make this finer and finer, you will get more and more surface. And remember, a surface is a defect because the atoms don't know whether they belong to this crystal structure or this crystal structure. And if you, if you hold this at a high temperature for a very long time, all the surfaces will disappear it'll tend to become a single crystal. Okay. Just like if you take soap froth, the bubbles will coarsen with time because the surface energy is, is being reduced. So that is a structural component of free energy. Yeah, so what we have to do is we have to calculate the amount of surface we have per unit volume. There's absolutely no need for you to think about the detail here. Basically, the amount of surface per unit volume is proportional to 1 upon the particle size. Particle size. This is just pure geometry here. Particles become smaller, the amount of surface increases. And of course, when this becomes zero, it becomes infinite. We are not ever going to get to a zero particle size, we've got atoms. And we have already got our enthalpy of mixing because all we have to do is scale this, multiply this by S3 and we have the contribution due to the bond energies at the interface. But we have to take account of the structural component of free energy which is because the atoms are not in their perfect positions for one crystal or the other crystal. So if we take the surface energy per unit area, sigma, is the surface energy per unit area. Per unit area. 
can be multiplied by the amount of surface we have per unit volume, then that gives us the enthalpy due to the defect. So this is an additional term which we must include because we don't have an atomic solution. Happy with that? That sigma is the energy per unit area. And this is the total amount of area I have per unit volume. So if I multiply that, then I get joules per meter cubed. And this is simply the molar volume, because I want to convert joules per meter cubed into joules per mole. Now, unfortunately, this gives us a result which contradicts our earlier experimental result that we have really formed a solid solution because the amount of surface we have per unit volume increases as the particle size decreases indefinitely. And this is always a positive term because sigma is positive, the surface energy is positive. It opposes the formation of a solution by this process. And this term will become overwhelming. It doesn't matter what the enthalpy of mixing is. We are creating defect as we make the particles grow smaller and smaller and what this says is that it is impossible to form a solution so there's something wrong with our theory we, I showed you experimentally we find that we have a perfect random solid solution on an atomic scale what this is saying is that whatever you do as the particles get smaller the defect density becomes so large the amount of surface per unit volume, that there's no way that solution formation is favored. Now, are you familiar with precipitation? That you have a matrix and you form a tiny precipitate. It starts off as a coherent particle. Okay. Stop me if you don't understand anything. You know, it, it forms as a particle which matches the structure of the parent then the particle grows and it breaks coherency and becomes incoherent. Right. You familiar with that? Yes or no? No, good. So I will show you a slide for that. Okay. Watch this. So imagine that this is a precipitate which is forming inside this matrix and these are lattice planes which are going through the particle. When the particle is small, and its crystal structure is different, so the spacing of the planes is different inside the particle, these planes can remain continuous through the particle. And that's what we call coherent. These planes of atoms are continuous. Even though they are distorted, they are continuous across the boundary between the particle and the matrix. So that's called coherent. Now, as the particle grows larger, it can still remain coherent, but notice that you know, the distortions are becoming larger and larger. Because here we have a different interplanar spacing, and here you don't. This distortion has become much larger than over here. Can you see that? So eventually what happens is that you can't tolerate a large distortion, and you break the continuity of planes. Yeah, so this plane, for example, no longer continues through the particle. And this is what we call a dislocation. Yeah, are you familiar with the concept of a dislocation? If you are not, it doesn't matter. It's simply that this plane ends at this point. And this is called an incoherent particle. And this has a larger energy, energy per unit area, than a situation like this where it's coherent. Yeah? So this is what happens in precipitation, that a small particle starts off as a coherent particle, but as it grows, the strains become larger and larger, and coherency breaks down. Now, what is the relevance of this to our problem? We are not pre actually precipitating anything. Well, the relevance is that we need to think in the opposite direction. Yeah, we, we're going to start with large particles, which are incoherent, and break them down into smaller and smaller particles and what will happen is that they will gain coherency. So you're decreasing the value of sigma as the particle becomes smaller and smaller. 
until eventually the boundary completely disappears because you have atoms and you don't have a boundary around an atom, do you? When the particle size becomes a single atom, the boundary simply disappears, becomes part of the crystal structure. So in mechanical alloying, what's happening is that you're doing the opposite of precipitation. You're starting with large particles, breaking them down into particles which are small enough so that you gain coherency and eventually sigma becomes zero. When that happens, of course, our original theory is wrong that this increases indefinitely. If sigma decreases as the particle size decreases, then all is well. Yeah. And that is in fact what happens. Okay, so if I, if I plot now the free energy of mixing, taking into account the fact that sigma is decreasing as I make my particles more coherent, then I find, okay, so this is the free energy of mixing and this is zero here. And this is the size of the particle, number of atoms. Yep. As I decrease the particle size, at first I get an increase in free energy because I'm creating more surface and I still haven't become coherent. It's only when coherency starts to kick in that I start to get a decrease and then of course the entropy of mixing comes in as well. And therefore I get this sharp decrease in free energy. And this is concentration here. Notice that the rate at which free energy decreases is larger when I have 0.5 because you remember that at a more fraction of 0.5 the configurational entropy of mixing is maximum. Yeah, that's why we have that curve which has a minimum at 0.5. Right? Now what we've predicted then is something very fundamental which was never known before and that is that there is a barrier to the formation of a solution by this mechanical alloy process. And the height of that barrier depends on how we gain uh, coherency as the particle size becomes smaller and smaller. So these are really quite spectacular results. Just on the basis of the three lectures that you had, the are fundamental results which have made, had a big impact in the science of mechanical alloying, simply from basic knowledge of thermodynamics. There's another a very fundamental statement that you will find in all textbooks on the thermodynamics of solutions. Now remember, this is the ideal entropy of mixing. Uh, normally we write Kn onto this side, but I've written on this side. If I differentiate delta Sm with respect to the concentration x, then you can show for yourself that you get this. If I now set x equal to zero, then I've got a logarithm here, so I get either plus or minus infinity if I set x equal to zero or one. What it's saying is that the slope of this curve here is infinite at this point and at this point, infinite slope. What I'm going to show you is that that is wrong. The slope is not infinite. This is purely a mathematical artifact where we assume that concentration is a continuous variable. But concentration is not a continuous variable. I can't change half an atom of chromium, right? So in fact, what we've demonstrated using our particulate model of the entropy of mixing is that you can't vary concentration continuously. This curve is actually a whole series of points might be very close to each other and the slope might be very large here, but it's not infinite. And it removes one of the sort of paradoxes in the theory that really the slope is not infinite. If I, if I can only vary from here to here rather than continuously, then the slope here won't be infinite. Now this doesn't change the world as we know it, but it's very interesting. Okay. Do you have any questions? I hope you realize, you know, that uh, your thermodynamics, even though it doesn't include kinetics, is an extremely powerful tool for a large number of industrial problems. And the reason why it's extremely powerful for industrial problems is that it deals with very large numbers of atoms, in other words, average properties. 
you know, you saw that from this chemical composition plot. That if somebody who doesn't know about thermodynamics looked at that, oops, looked at that, they would say, look, I haven't succeeded in mechanically alloying the material. Yeah. This is not a heterogeneous solution. This is a homogeneous solution. When we talk about thermodynamics, we talk about large numbers of atoms. Exactly the numbers of atoms you deal with when you make something. Okay. Any questions? Okay, see you next time.